Welcome to our first lesson in this River of Life series. In this lesson we're going to look at what uh, God's original blueprint for us really was. And we're going to have a look at God's Word and what that does for us. And it brings life to us. It restores us. I think it's important for us to understand, especially in this season of COVID, where we're having uh, different aspects of that um, pandemic affecting us. I think everyone would agree that life this year hasn't been the same. Life this year has been interrupted by uh, COVID, medical, uh, different aspects like that as we go along. And I, it's hard to, when you think about that, it's hard to be the light on the hill when you're constantly being locked down, having face masks. It's quite difficult to be all that God has called us to be. And this is a healthy and a good reminder for each and every one of us to go back to what God's original blueprint for us was. And we're going to do, do that by looking at some key aspects. And one of the aspects we're looking at is water. And not just water as in uh, the, the physical aspect of water, but also the spiritual aspect of water. You see, we know that Jesus walked on water. We know that the, the, the sea was divided to uh, allow the Israelites through and to, to crush the, the Egyptians. We know that Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. There's so many aspects about water, but we're going to focus on the spiritual aspect of water. And what the spiritual aspect of water is throughout the Bible, throughout the thread of the Bible, is about life. And that's what we're going to have a look at here. So when we want to look at blueprints, probably one of the best places to start is in the book of Genesis, at the beginning of the Bible, where God created the Garden of Eden. I think that represents a, uh, a slice, for me, a slice of heaven here on earth. You know, the, uh, it was created by God for Adam and Eve. And that's the blueprint, the original blueprint. And we're going to have a look at that and unpack that and what that actually means. I think it's a, it's a place given by God to man and woman so that every need would be met. It's interesting when you look at the, uh, the story of the Garden of Eden, it doesn't talk about what's surrounding the Garden of Eden until Adam and Eve were actually removed from the garden. So it was created by God for man for them to last forever in that paradise. And it's interesting when we look at that aspect of the Garden of Eden, and we can understand the, the small nuances of that, it's important then that when we understand that, when we have an idea of that, we can then get an idea of God and what He wanted for us and that blueprint. So there's not much information that we know about the Garden of Eden. There are a few things in there, of course, throughout uh, Genesis. For example, in Genesis 2.8, it says, The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. Genesis 1.28 goes and unpacks what the garden looked like a little further. It says that he instructed Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moved on the earth. We also know from scripture that there are certain trees in there. We all know about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but sometimes we don't realize that there was another special tree in there, the tree of life. Other aspects of the, uh, uh, the, the picture of the Garden of Eden have all these beautiful trees. We have animals roaming around and there was a, a synergy, a unity there. And it also says that God would walk with them in the cool of the day. That paints a beautiful picture. But the, th the key thing is for us to understand the blueprint even further, we have to picture what it is to be in the Garden of Eden. So what I'd like you to do now, I know we've just started, but this is important for you to understand your understanding of the, uh, the garden to help you develop and move forward. So I just want you to pause the video in a minute and I want you in groups of two or three just to talk about what your thoughts are about the Garden of Eden, what it looked like, but also the second aspect to that is once you discuss that, is what the purpose of each of those things that God placed in the Garden of Eden. So just take a moment now and explore that and we'll be back shortly. <music> 
So how did everybody go? Did you uh, have a picture of what the Garden of Eden looked like? Did you work out some of the, uh, the, the purposes for some of those things? I wonder if you worked out where the Garden of Eden is located. I wonder if you thought about the different plants and what they were in there for. You know, did you work out about the, uh, the tree of knowledge and good and evil, why that was placed there? Or why the tree of life was placed there? Did you work out the expanse of what the Garden of Eden uh, looked like? How big it was? Some of those aspects are important for us to understand because the Bible talks about that when we understand the intricacies, when we understand the interplay between how all these things uh, gel and join up together, we have a greater picture and then we have a greater appreciation of what's important to God because God placed those things in the garden for Adam and Eve. And that's the original blue, blueprint. It's like the body. The body's made up of a number of different muscles, sinews, uh, uh, bones and things like that. And then when we activate things, we don't realize that there's so many other things in the, in the background working together. Like when you raise a glass or you do a particular action. We see certain things, but there's things behind the scenes, like within us, that we don't see. And that's the point I'm trying to make here about the blueprint of uh, the Garden of Eden. When we understand that, we understand, we get, we get a, a better understanding of the heart of God, the character of God. But one particular aspect people may not think about is the elevation. Where was the Garden of Eden located, but how high it was? Because what we do know is that the water flowed through the Garden of Eden and then it divided into four rivers. And what we do know from that is obviously water runs downhill. And those four rivers, rivers represent the four corners of the earth. It's interesting when we understand those aspects of it, we can understand the purpose of the Garden of Eden. We, then we can understand the purpose or the blueprint for our lives, for that's what God originally set up for us. And I love in the scripture how it talks about purposes and our understanding of the purpose. Isaiah, for example, 55, 10 through 11, verse 11, talks about this particular aspect. It talks about the purpose of God and what He does when He sets things up, like the Garden of Eden. And I'd just like to read that out to you. Starting in verse 10, it says, As the rain and the, and the snow came down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Verse 11 goes on to say, So is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish all that I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That's such a good revelation for us if we understand what that means. The verse 10 talks about how God's love, His character for us, what He wants us, He said He will water the earth. But not only water the earth for the earth's sake, but He waters the earth to make it bud and flourish. But not just that. He wants us to continue on. So it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. See, he talks about here, when he waters the earth, the purpose is not just to water the earth, but to allow it to grow, allow it to flourish. But not only that, but then the next level down is so that the person will have food to eat in the now, but also seed for the future. That's an amazing revelation we can, when we can capture that. Because then when we dovetail that into verse 11, when he goes on to say that my words, my words go out of my mouth and it will not return empty. What that means he's saying is that when I speak life, when I say things, it goes out and it will not return void. It will not return empty. What that means is what he set out to achieve will be achieved. And that's such an amazing revelation. Again, when we understand that the Word of God, when He says certain things, will happen. Will happen. And as we see in verse 10, it may not happen straight away. That's why sometimes our prayers aren't answered. We feel straight away. But as we can see, God watered the earth. And then He allowed that to bud and flourish. And then the third thing was that it was producing seed, but also seed, but all, uh, the bread for us as well. And sometimes when we read the word and we don't allow or we don't see what God's um, word is achieving straight away, we sometimes wonder and worry. It's clear here that God says, what I say we will achieve. So if we take the scripture in Isaiah and go back and overlay it over the, the picture that we have about the Garden of Eden, there is a number of key lessons that we learn from that. One of the key lessons is that everything God does has a purpose.
We know the topography of the Garden of Eden, or we have an idea. And we often focus on the actual garden itself. But what's important to note here is that not only is it the garden itself, but there's a river that flows from that. A river that flows from God's place into the world. And we see that illustration, that, uh, that idea of the flowing of God's love, the flowing of God's word, the flowing of his uh, grace and mercy from him throughout the world. Here it's represented in the Garden of Eden. But if you have a look in the Bible, in Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Revelation, it talks about the flowing of God from the Garden of Eden, but also the temple, but also the river of life, which comes from us. My word shall not return back empty, not back void, it says here. It shows his character for us, his love for us. If there's a purpose to everything in the Bible, what's the purpose of the flowing river through the Garden of Eden? As we spoke about before, uh, for water to flow naturally, it must be from a higher point to a lower point. And symbolically, what that means is that in the Garden of Eden, God set up an environment where His love, His grace, His mercy, everything about God would flow through the garden itself, but not only end there, but go into the world to go out into, to reach the, the lost, to reach the lonely. And that's symbolic of the Garden of Eden, but it's also symbolic and important for us to understand as well and what that means for us. What does it mean for us? What is God's purpose for our lives? I just want you to take a, a moment to think about that particular aspect of the Garden of Eden and what you think the purpose of the river flowing through the Garden of Eden was. Not only through, but out into the world. Just take a moment, talk about that in your life groups. I'll be back shortly. So how did you go? What were your thoughts on why the river flowed from the Garden of Eden? I think it's, uh, it's obvious when we read the redemptive message of the Bible, we read that how God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, for us, that we understand why the Garden of Eden wasn't isolated and God's grace and mercy and love for us was allowed to flow through us, uh, through the garden into people who haven't heard from God. And that's important when we overlay that across our life. What's the purpose of our life? Do we have a river flowing through us into the community and what aspects of that can we take on board as we move forward there's another key aspect that we can learn from this when we overlay the passage from Isaiah over the Garden of Eden it talks about God's Word containing nutrients for our lives we see in the Bible quite often where the river will flow and then they have trees planted near the river and they grow because of the the roots go into the soil and get the nutrients from the uh, the uh, the water. It's so important for us to understand as well. He talks about here the water in terms of throughout the Bible, it talks about the flowing water. But as we know, as the Bible goes on, as we hear from Jesus when he talks about his redemptive love for us, he talks about this flowing water that comes through us. His desire for us is not only that we not only grow, but flourish. I will accomplish what I desire. We need to understand the Garden of Eden represents God's blueprint for our life. And the water aspect flowing through it is the life blood flowing through the garden. And then from that, it does go out. And when we understand our position and how we need to be close to that source, we can then understand how we can move forward as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be alongside we need to be near we can't be far away from the the source of our spiritual growth and journey the desert fathers said that when adam and eve were removed from the garden of eden they said that the oral custom was that adam would sit in the flow of the river coming out of the garden of eden you see he knew that he couldn't go back in there but what he did was he was able to sit in and soak in the water 
that came from God. And he said that the oral traditions um, would say that he would do that to cleanse himself. We need to understand that we need to do the same. We live in a world where so many things are happening, so many distractions, so many things that are pulling us away. We need to understand the source of life. We need to understand that we need to be close to it. We need to be like Adam within the Garden of Eden, but also uh, soaking and being cleansed from it as well. I just wanted to finally touch base on the last aspect of this when we overlay that scripture over the Garden of Eden. And it really hones in the point about this Garden of Eden and the water flowing through it was a template for our lives, a blueprint. You see, throughout the Bible, in Genesis, but also the prophets, um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, but also a revelation, they all talk about this flow of water from God. The, uh, in Genesis, it talks about from the Garden of Eden, but in the prophets, it talks about from the temple. And you know, it's interesting, there are three times where the, the water of life, the water of living, uh, the, the living water, I should say, is spoken about in the Bible. And three particular aspects. God speaks about having that flow of living water through him. Jesus, we know about the woman at the well, has water flowing, the living water flowing through, her, uh, through him, where he spoke to her about. And there's one final aspect. It talks about the flow of living water through us. You see, God's design for us in the Garden of Eden is a template for our lives. With all the distractions in life, especially, as I mentioned in the beginning, COVID and all the implications from that, sometimes we do go off the path, the straight and narrow path that the Bible talks about. I think this series is a good reminder for us to be able to say that even though distractions of the world exist and we sometimes can go astray, we always have a blueprint that we can go back to. We always have something that we can re recalibrate to refocus on what we, what we should be doing. The key point of the Garden of Eden and the flow of water through that is that the God creates an environment for us to, to live. But not just to live, but to flourish. Not just to flourish, but to excel. Sometimes we don't feel like that, but the blueprint is there. And I would encourage you over this series to be able to not only just listen to these uh, messages, I should say, uh, yeah, the life group sessions, but also to ponder and understand, try to understand the purpose. Ask the question, why did God do that? Why did he place that person there? Why did he place that particular aspect? Because when we understand the why, we can then begin to understand the character of God. And when we understand the character of God, that's when we start to grow. That's when we start to develop. That's when we start to be all that God has called us to be. We're not a bystander, we're a, we're a participant in the growth of the kingdom. Because we each and every one of uh, each and every one of us has a role to play. Well, we hope this has blessed you. And what we're going to do now is we're going to put a few questions on the screen for more conversation and discussion. God bless. You.